Welcome everyone once again. Let's talk about politics and governance today. The topic, platform workers. Are they employees or contractors? Because in Canada and the European Union, the two case studies we're gonna have here, the status of platform workers is quite a hot topic. So on both sides of the Atlantic, policymakers, uh, labor advocates are grappling with how to protect the rights of these workers who are often misclassified as contractors. And so I have invited Raoul Gibert to explain to us, to let us know more about the differences, the different approaches that Canada and the European Union are taking uh, to this issue. So we're going to talk about, um, we're going to discuss the challenges, the opportunities that lie ahead for platform workers in, um, in both regions. Raoul, welcome to our episode. Yes, good morning. Hello. So Raoul, tell us about why you decided to conduct research on platform workers, because well, the European Union and Canada are both taking steps to address this issue and is an area of active research and debate, apparently. Yeah, I mean, the, the platform economy, uh, people were thinking about an oil platform here that if they're not on the right track. This is the platform economy, gig workers, we also call them. Um, it's obviously a, a part of the economy that just grow uh, is growing exponentially. And um, uh, this, this uh, large growth in that sector uh, has really created a mismatch between uh, labor law and practice, but also between uh, labor organizations and, and actors on the labor market uh, and uh, uh, these workers, uh, where there's now millions who are, as you rightfully mentioned, are either misclassified or maybe they're classified correctly, but they're lacking sort of basic protections. And that motivated me to look at the sector and at these workers a little bit more closely to see mm -hmm. how they can potentially benefit from some of the protections that other workers do. Yeah, because as you said, it's a sector that's growing exponentially. So there was, and you are very clear in the article about this, there is a clear gap in research when it comes to platform work. Is that so? Well, the, the gap really uh, exists both in research and in practice, right? Uh, it is something that is very quickly developing and has been developing over the last couple of years. Uh, so I think researchers having to play catch up and trying to wrap its mind around uh, how to how to tackle this and and we can talk about the two different ways of uh, trying to include these workers uh, uh, in a little bit more detail afterwards but there's also a gap in the practice right so practitioners are actually looking for uh, advice and and looking for new solutions to try to mm -hmm. deal with the very uh, practical problems that arise be it occupational health and safety uh, be it uh, uh, high turnover and, and dissatisfaction with jobs and so on and so forth uh, mm -hmm. that can happen in these uh, in these conditions. Mm -hmm. You set out to then explore the rights, several ways of rights for platform workers. So let us know about the most important findings or highlights of your study. So I, I think um, my argument as I'm, I'm not a labor lawyer, so labor lawyers can argue, argue the other side. Um, while it is important to obviously update the labor codes and the labor, the norms that were uh, employ employment norms and so on and so forth, I think one of one of my main uh, objectives of the article was to show that labor market actors, uh, such as trade unions, but also potentially uh, employers' organizations or or uh, professional uh, associations, they need to step up to the plate here and they need to reach out to these workers uh, because just. Uh, either squeezing these, and this is the two different ways of doing it uh, that I referred to earlier, uh, just squeezing these uh, platform workers into the existing labor code with a couple of tweaks uh, or uh, creating some other sort of frameworks that would uh, be uh, directed to, uh, only to platform workers is, is going to fail if, if we don't actually reach out to these workers and organize them and, and have their uh, collective input on it. And I think uh, that is really what this uh, uh, story from the field work also tells quite uh, impressively, uh, that when uh, a traditional labor market actor like a trade union reaches out and organizes these people and, and uh, organizes, organizes them their way, right, uh, meets them halfway and, and brings them in, uh, then you can get some success with traditional labor law or maybe uh, an upgraded version thereof but if if we don't do that if it's if it's something that only happens in the field of policy uh, lawmaking and and uh, um, uh, in the labor courts uh, then we're unlikely to succeed and maybe that's the 
uh, that's the pitfalls for uh, for the European scenario if we only go about it from the European Union as a as a directive and and then uh, implementation in the countries. Uh, there needs to be action as well uh, with uh, labor market organizations being involved. Mm -hmm. Because uh, so let's talk about action. Because so you revealed a bit about the the actors of the labor market in this situation. So I'm curious to know more about. Uh, policy implications for this, uh, it may, maybe in both cases of Canada and uh, European Union. What can you tell us about that? Yeah. So, I mean, I look specifically at the food delivery uh, market uh, mm -hmm. um, as, as one of the subsector of these of this growing uh, platform work, uh, work that's essentially dictated by algorithms. And, and I think a couple of uh, the policy elements that give the workers the tool Uh, to work uh, together, but also to a certain point to work with their, uh, what I would call employers, uh, employers don't always agree with that, um, uh, to, to, to address some of the main issues, uh, that, that's really where policy uh, uh, can help, right? So it is about uh, having information about the algorithms uh, that, that they work for or that they work under, uh, so that scheduling and, and uh, payment uh, arrangements, fees, schedules, and so on and so forth, uh, become at the very least transparent. Um, uh, questions around discipline, uh, these algorithms that will upgrade or downgrade you based on uh, uh, you know, delivery times and, and scores uh, that were attributed by, uh, the, uh, by the clients, for example. Uh, so that's one basket, I would say, of transparency, you know, dealing with these algorithms themselves and, and, and making sure that workers actually understand how they fit into this, uh, this uh, uh, machinery. Uh, the other aspect is occupational health and safety. So the, the whole issues around workplace uh, safety uh, and workplace accidents, um, I mean, it becomes really tricky when there's no workplace, no physical workplace, and, and nobody will expect from some of these companies to control everything that's going on uh, in terms of the weather, in terms of the road conditions, in terms of other reckless drivers uh, and, and all of these, these really horrible stories that I uh, was able to, to um, yeah. collect uh, during the field work. However, <laughs> uh, there's policy involved, right? I mean, this is not the first time we have mobile, mobile workforce. Um, so that, that there is potential uh, uh, options for the policymaker, be it uh, some, for, some form of no fault insurance, uh, definitely uh, having a, a payment uh, a scheme for, uh, we call it workman, workman's comp or Uh, workers' compensation schemes. Uh, mm -hmm. So these types of um, uh, policy uh, tools need to be updated and upgraded in order to uh, protect and include these workers. Mm -hmm. And what do you, what opportunities do you think that there is for further research in this topic? For example, other sectors than food delivery markets, or yeah. also maybe the role of like technologies and the platforms, because you mentioned the algorithm. So yeah. what's what's ahead of us now? Yeah. So I mean, we can think of the the, the platform economy on a sort of scale of uh, how much autonomy do I have uh, and how, how, how good or bad are my working conditions. And, and in terms of the food delivery sector, uh, people are in the, uh, I would say in the, in the quarter uh, that has very little autonomy in terms of control over, the work, uh, over, the, over their work um, and that have relatively poor working conditions. But certainly this research um, and looking at the platform economy also needs to eventually Uh, look at other gig workers who may have more autonomy because they have better skills, for example, or uh, people who have, you know, better working conditions to a certain point, but, but lack the autonomy, right? So I think these two elements uh, and, and the two examples that I gave, so the algorithmic management and the transparency around it, that speaks to the autonomy aspect and the, uh, the working conditions, uh, be it health and safety problems or pay, uh, uh, vacation, family uh, equilibrium and so on and so forth, that is on a, on a second scale. And I, I think by, by really going into these two research axes around transparency and the algorithm itself on the one hand, and then the working conditions on the other, I think we can start to map out the uh, uh, platform economy a lot better and find solutions that are appropriate for different groups of workers there. Perfect. This has been an episode very straight to the point, but I would like to challenge you to wrap this episode up. If someone just came to join our conversation and you only had one or two sentences to pass the message, the most important message of your research, what would it be? The platform economy is growing and it's not going away. 
and both legislators and worker organizations, uh, labor market organizations need to step up their game in order to reach out to these workers and uh, more meaningfully protect them and include them in the, uh, uh, well, in the labor market uh, in, in a meaningful way. Great episode. Raul, thank you very much. Thank you, Rodrigo. To all the viewers, if you are watching us on YouTube, you can find all the resources, all the materials, some uh, background materials, and the article that was based, the study that was served as based for this conversation on the Let's Talk About Politics and Governance website. This episode is also available wherever you get your podcast, should you prefer an alternative uh, format. And you can subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on Twitter at Cogitatio LTA.